Um, also, I just really want to welcome you all back. Tom and I were had other um, duties last month, so I'm just so glad to be back and um, hosting the webinar series again. Um, so uh, let's see how we're doing now. I'm going to go ahead and run through just a few um, logistics about the webinar. Um, today, we're fortunate to have Dr. Kevin Corris here with us to discuss uh, plant health and diagnosing plant disease. Um, this is a slight deviation from the published schedule, so we just really want to thank him for, for stepping in and, and, and speaking to this group today. It should be a really great webinar. Um, it, it is approved for um, one FNGLA, um, Florida Water Star, LAIF, DBPR, Landscape Architecture, and FDAX, LF, LCLM, LLO, CLO and ONT CEU. Um, so anyone who um, put in for a CEU will still be able to get those credits. If you're looking for a CEU, it, it, there is a $10 administration fee to receive a certificate for continuing education. Um, I'll go ahead and put that link in the chat box in case you, you know, you've decided you'd like to go ahead and get a CEU. Otherwise, um, you know, the, the webinar is free and, and we hope you enjoy it. Um, and this is part of a monthly webinar series held on the second Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. Our next webinar is Irrigation Technology um, for Water Conservation, and that's with Dr. Michael Dukes. And um, as always, this is a webinar. Your, micro your microphones have been muted. Um, so please put your questions in the chat box, and we'll take them at the end of the presentation. Um, you'll also see a survey invitation pop up. So please take a moment to fill out the uh, survey for us. It really helps us determine what kind of future educational programs we're going to offer and, you know, um, how we're doing in, in this series. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Tom Wickman to introduce today's speaker. Claire, thank you so much. Um, my name is Tom Wickman and I'm the statewide coordinator for the GIBMP program. And, uh, and I'm so glad to see so many folks joining us this morning. It's kind of ugly weather outside, so um, no better place than to be inside, hopefully uh, watching this in, a, in the comfort of, uh, of a building. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Kevin Corris. He's the UF IFAS Extension Alachua County Agriculture and Natural Resources Agent. He's a native of Nebraska, where he received three degrees, a bachelor's in horticulture, master's in plant pathology, and in 2016, the doctor of plant health. He has spent the last four years as the coordinator of the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic and an extension educator at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. During this time, he was able to gain experience with a wide range of agronomic, horticulture, and landscape plants and the insect and disease and nutrient issues that he faced. He's passionate about diagnosing plant health issues and firmly believes that the correct management plan can only be developed after the correct diagnosis has been made. He's excited to continue being an advocate of plant health and looks forward to addressing the issues that will arise in Florida. Today, Dr. Kors is going to be speaking about plant health and diagnosing plant problems. I'm certainly looking forward to this presentation and I think you'll find it very interesting. It's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Dr. Kevin Kors. All righty, well, thank you so much, Tom, and hopefully everyone can hear me loud and clear. Um, I, I appreciate that. Um, I will confess that um, I originally developed this um, presentation for um, a master gardener crowd, and, and I know that I'm dealing with a lot of industry folks here, so I hope that this isn't too basic. Um, I don't think it will be, and, and even if it is, it's always good to have a little bit of a brush up on, on some of these um, plant disease issues that we, we most likely face on, on a daily basis. So, uh, And some of these are coming from the standpoint of um, diseases in the landscape, and you all may be dealing with um, more of a greenhouse or a, a growing production type of, of situation, but uh, everything certainly applies to all those situations. So um, excited to kind of get going on this and um, didn't realize there was going to be such a great introduction to pretty much my background. Um, so I can kind of zoom through these slides, but as it was mentioned, I, I did receive my bachelor's of science in horticulture, my uh, master's of science in agronomy, but I had a focus on plant pathology. I noticed when I was getting my uh, horticulture degree that I was actually way better at killing plants 
than I was at growing them. So plant pathology really stuck a, struck a chord with me. And I, I really enjoyed learning about all of the things that can kind of impact and, and, and make our plants sick. Um, and then finally, as I was uh, wrapping up my master's degree in, in agronomy, I, uh, at the University of Nebraska, they had developed what was called the Doctor of Plant Health Program. And it was very intriguing to me because um, th the idea of the course is that it trains um, plant health practitioners in a wide range of subjects. So instead of becoming a specialist in one particular small area of plant systems biology, the Doctor of Plant Health trains practitioners to know about entomology, about weed science, about plant pathology, about soil science, about plant water relations. So everything involved in growing plants, we cover in depth in the Doctor of Plant Health Program. And the Doctor of Plant Health Program at the University of Nebraska actually has ties with the University of Florida because the Doctor of Plant Health is a sister program that was developed um, from the Doctor of Plant Medicine Program which was founded and, and developed here at the University of Florida. Um, so the guy who basically, the professor who wrote the book on plant pathology that I studied out of Dr. George Agrios was a, um, a professor here at the University of Florida. And he envisioned training um, plant pr practitioners um, almost in the same style as a, a, a doctor of veterinary medicine who could kind of go out and diagnose and deal with a wide range of issues. So uh, it was developed here at the University of Florida and the sister program then came in um, uh, and was developed in about 2010 um, in, in, in Nebraska. And those are the only two universities in the nation that have this program. So proud graduate of the Doctor of Plant Health and kind of in a weird twist of fate ended up working back here for the University of Florida. Um, so as was mentioned, I did um, spend five years in Nebraska diagnosing plants in the, the plant diagnostic clinic. I was the coordinator. Um, we had an entomology clinic. So a lot of the insect samples that I received actually went to our entomologist, but I did all of the uh, other uh, plant um, deficiencies and plant diseases. Um, I, I looked at with my own two eyeballs and learned quite a bit. Um, and you think, well, from Nebraska, you probably just dealt with corn and soybeans, but I actually did deal with a wide range of plants, fruits, vegetables, uh, landscape ornamentals, turf, you name it, I looked at it. So um, I do uh, have a pretty decent background in plant diseases. So um, currently I work as the um, Agricultural Row Crop and Natural Resources Extension Agent in here, here in Alachua County in Florida, um, doing a lot of stuff, mostly with agronomic row crops in my current position. So working with corn, soybeans, peanuts, as you can see there, doing a fungicide trial with a, the agent from uh, Hamilton County, Keith, in that bottom left-hand picture. Um, and tobacco, all, all, all things considered row crops is, is what I take care of now. And then of course, natural resources. So. That's kind of me and that's where I'm from and what I've done. And today we're gonna to talk about what our plant disease is. So, um, you know, when we think of the classic definition of plant disease, um, it's actually anything that prevents a plant from performing to its maximum potential. So it doesn't have to be a biological agent that causes disease. So abiotic diseases are diseases as well. And so what do we mean by that? So an abiotic disease is anything that's caused by a non-living agent. So sun scorch, nutrient deficiency, nutrient toxicity, which would be like a chemical burn. Um, any of those things can actually be considered plant diseases. We just call them abiotic diseases or abiotic distress disorders is probably more accurate. And then of course we have the biotic diseases, those that are caused by living agents. And in that bottom right hand picture there, we see a black knot of rows is what it's called. Um, uh, it's not always on rows. It's, it's a lot of prunus species get it as well. Um, um, black, black knot of, of pretty much anything in the rosaceae family. Um, and it's a fungus that creates these kind of real nasty, thick black galls on the stems um, and can cause, cause dieback. But anyway, that's uh, something that's caused by a biological agent. So in general, we teach that there are five biological agents that cause disease. Fungi, bacteria, nematodes, which if depends on where you learn, where you get your degrees. Um, nematodes are sometimes considered uh, plant parasites versus plant pathogens. I learned that they're a pathogen because they actually infect plant material. Um, but uh, either way, they're microscopic little worms that live typically in the soil. And then of course we have uh, viruses. 
So that's four, I mentioned five. Um, there are also things called mycoplasmas and we'll take a look at what those are too. So I really like to start with this graph because when we're talking about plant pathogens, right? So the biological agents that cause plant disease, it's kind of good to get in mind their relative sizes, right? Because a lot of diagnosis happens from symptom expression, but if we wanna actually visualize and, and have proof that a particular pathogen is present in our plants, um, we kind of have to realize that you need a microscope because these things are tiny. So if we look at that figure on the right-hand side there, at, at 12 o'clock, uh, we see what is the head of a nematode. So that's just the very, very tip head of, of one of those microscopic worms that lives in the soil. And you can see that what looks to be like a black arrow, I hope you can see my mouse moving on the screen there, um, but uh, in, in that head there is, is a black arrow and that's its feeding apparatus. It's called a stylet. And so imagine like a, like a sewing needle, hypodermic needle that they can force in and out of their mouth pretty rapidly. Um, and basically they use that to macerate the plant cell tissues and then they make it a, a slurpy and they suck it up. So you can imagine that creates a lot of cellular damage uh, for the plant. If we move to about three o'clock there, what we see is the very tip of a fungal hypha. Okay, so when we think of fungus, we typically think of like the stock and cap mushroom, or we think of green or black fuzzy on our bread. Well, when we see fungi in that state, that's their reproductive state. That's when they're going to produce spores and, and, and try to reproduce. But 98% of the time, fungi don't exist in a reproductive state. They exist in their vegetative state. And in their vegetative state, they uh, exist as mycelia. Um, hyphae and mycelia are the same thing. And th those are just words to describe the vegetative state of fungi. And if you think about a spider web, that's kind of what it is. It's these little tiny threads that the fungus exists in. So that picture uh, that you're seeing there at three o'clock um, on the right-hand side of that diagram is just the tip of that fungal thread. And what it does is it invaginates the cell. Um, it gets through the cell wall, but it actually doesn't penetrate the cell membrane, but it's able to exchange things from the cell and absorbs the nutrients from the cell um, and depletes the energy sources of the cell and, and eventually kills the cell. Then at the bottom uh, corner there, bottom kind of right-hand corner, we see the nucleus, the relative size of a plant nucleus. Um, and sorry, this is, I should have mentioned too, this is the, uh, this is kind of your typical plant cell. And so you're seeing the cell wall here um, and then all of the, um, the pathogens that are and their relative size according to your typical plant cell. I think I forgot to mention that. Um, so then finally down um, about seven o'clock there and kind of the bottom left-hand uh, side of the, of the cell is a bacterium. So bacteria are single celled organisms that are contained within a cell wall. Sometimes they're flagellated, meaning they, have, meaning they have a little tail, which allows them to swim, but oftentimes they're not flagellated. So you can see that there. Um, I, hope, I hope you can see my mouse because I want to use that to point things out. If you can't see my mouse, Emily, just let me know. Yes, Kevin, they can see your mouse. Okay, awesome. All right. And then, um, and then we have here these things called mycoplasmas. So I talked about mycoplasmas a little bit, and they're kind of a newer uh, group of plant pathogens. They're very much like uh, bacteria where they're single celled, but they're not contained within a cell wall. They're kind of these amorphous blobs of cellular contents, um, very much like a bacterium without the cell wall. Uh, eukaryotes, they do not contain a nucleus. And then finally, you have our smallest of our plant pathogens, which are our viruses. And then, of course, you can see them in their relative sizes here. Uh, they're very, very small. We can't visualize them with a light microscope. We have to use a scanning electron microscope just to visualize them. So those are our plant pathogens, and those are pretty much what we're going to be talking about today and some of the diseases that they cause on all sorts of different kinds of landscape, uh, perennials, uh, annuals, and just uh, plants in general. So... Uh, that just uh, puts a name to everything there. So just going into a little bit more depth on each one. So we'll start with the smallest one. Um, viruses, of course, like I said, they're too small to be seen with a light microscope. Um, they've got to be uh, uh, visualized using a um, scanning electron microscope. They're typically transmitted from plant to plant by something. Uh, usually it's insects. Um, aphids are a big one, but it could be mites. Um, nematodes, right? The microscopic little worms. 
can actually move viruses from plant to plant, fungi, and even humans. Um, so uh, especially um, really sturdy viruses like um, tobacco mosaic virus can be uh, moved from, from plant to plant by humans, uh, by touch, by our pruning materials, things like that that can survive long enough to where you cut a plant that's infected, you cut another plant that's not infected, but now it is because it survived on those pruning shears. So this is a couple of um, a couple of different types of viruses here. We have pasta virus X in the top corner. In the bottom, we have tulip virus X, and that's actually a historically famous um, virus because it caused this really beautiful patterning in our tulip bulbs and our tulip flowers. And um, it ended up causing a crash, though, in the Dutch economy in the 1600s um, because these uh, tulips were infected with a virus and they made these beautiful tulip colors. But they didn't understand that this was being caused by a virus, right? So they didn't necessarily know how to replicate it. And one of these, a single um, tulip uh, 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 cut flower, a single flower could go for 13,000 florins, which at one time I, I, I equated that to what it was in, in dollars now. It's a lot. I don't remember what it was, but it's, in, it's also in the thousands. And back then too, that was, that was an incredible amount of money for a single tulip flower. But the fact that they didn't know how to duplicate it is that the virus was there, it was in their tulips, it, you know, there was, the population was high, but then the population crashed and all of a sudden they couldn't get this cool tulip breaking color anymore. Um, and, you know, they were able, when they were able to, you know, charge 13,000 florins for a single bulb and then all of a sudden it worked. So um, it really did a number on, on their economy in the 1600s. Um, so uh, moving on then, we have bacteria, right? So bacteria are single celled organisms that are contained within a cell wall. Typically, when it comes to disease infection, an opening is required for that uh, bacterium to get into the plant. Um, they don't have active mechanisms uh, to penetrate plant uh, surfaces, unlike fungi and nematodes, they can actively penetrate bacteria can't. So they require natural leaf openings, so stomates, um, uh, hy hydathodes um, on the edge of leaves, wounds, they can take advantage of wounds um, and they can also be vectored by insects from plant to plant. They typically survive in infected plant debris, but they can also survive in the soil as well. So what we're seeing here, this is a corn leaf um, with a bacterial disease called Goss's wilt. And this is actually what I studied my, uh, got my master's degree on. It's a pretty big disease. It was discovered in Nebraska. So there was a tie there, but um, like I said, it, you usually see this bacterial diseases in general pop up when there's a lot of plant wounding. So we would get hailstorms. So we do get hailstorms every summer uh, in Nebraska, and that creates a ton of wounding on our corn. And then after that, we'll see a huge flare up of bacterial diseases, especially this um, this Goss's uh, bacterial wilt of corn. So it's really unique um, symptoms that it causes. Uh, it, it causes really long streaks with uh, oblong pattern, uh, uh, wall, kind of um, lesion walls. And it'll have what's called these discontinuous water soaked spots. So you'll see these blackish spots appear both in the dead material and in the healthy green plant material. Um, and if, if you look at it just right in the light, you'll see a shine because um, the bacteria exudes kind of a liquid sticky uh, material and that will shine. Um, and then in general, bacteria will cause what's called water soaking on their plants. Um, some fungi can do it as well, but, but bacteria will, will often cause water soaking. And basically picture if you have uh, like a bag of spinach in your fridge and you pinch it, and then you look at it, you'll notice that, that where you pinched is kind of a dark watery, um, you know, it'll be a, there'll be a dark watery mark there. And that's basically what happens is that the cells burst and they're no longer contained within plant cell walls. And there's just all this content, cellular contents floating free. And that's very, very typical of bacterial infection. Uh, you can visualize clouds of bacteria coming out of plants. So that's what we're seeing in that bottom picture there is I put some plant material on a microscope slide and some water. And because of the differences in pressure, all of these bacterial cells came flooding out uh, into the water. And that's kind of what that cloud is there. So you can see these with a, with a light microscope, 
but you have to have thousands or millions of cells in order to visualize them. You can't see a single bacterial cell. Okay, fungi. Fungi are probably the biggest, the largest group of plant pathogens that we have to deal with. Uh, we have viral issues, we have fungal issues, we have nematode issues, especially down here in Florida, but fungi across the board are probably the most common pathogen group. So as I mentioned, fungi grow via hyphae, which are these small thread-like filaments. So if we look at this top right-hand picture, that is the root of a uh, grass. I believe that's a Kentucky bluegrass. And then in the middle, you'll see a dark line running up and down it. So that's magnaporthy. That's a fungal hyphae that is running along that root and it's invaginating into that root and sucking up the cellular contents. So um, that is a pathogenic hyphae, fungal hyphae from uh, uh, magnaporthy, which causes um, take all patch in turf. Take all, yeah, take all patch. So when you have a bunch of hyphae together, it's called mycelium. So you can see that in that middle picture, it looks like cobwebs, right? It's actually fungal mycelium, those fungal threads. Spores are their reproductive structures. Um, they'll get triggered to sporulate when they run out of food, or there'll be oftentimes there'll be other climatic factors that can trigger them to sporulate. But most of the time, whenever you're seeing a fungus reproduce, it's because it's run out of food. Uh, most, whoops, most fungi require free moisture to cause infection for plants. And that's a big, big thing to understand. A very important point when, when, when thinking about fungal plant infections is that a surface of water, even a thin, tiny layer of water on the plant surface will exacerbate infection. So we always say, if you deal with a lot of foliar fungal issues, make sure you're watering the soil and you're not watering the leaves, right? They're not taking water up typically through their leaves anyway. So if you can just water the soil and keep those leaves dry, dry leaves, less fungal infection. Um, so, so unfortunately fungi can survive readily in the soil. They don't need to be contained within infected plant debris, but they will survive better within infected plant debris. And of course, there's always exceptions to the rules. Some fungi don't uh, survive well in the soil alone and they'll get eaten up and destroyed right away. Other fungi are, are very uh, happy in the soil and they can kind of compete with the other microbes and live in the soil just fine. So again, that's another important thing to consider when we're talking about management, right? So sanitation is huge, um, cleaning up your material and that's uh, your, your, your infected plant material. Uh, if it's in a greenhouse, if it's in the field, you want to remove infected plant material because that's their source of of over seasoning. That's how they come back is from that uh, infected plant residue. Um, so if you're in a, if a field situation and you can't really just clean up your whole field and put it in a pile and burn it, uh, tillage is a good way to help uh, reduce fungal inoculum. So incorporating that plant material into the soil so it breaks down. And of course, that's only going to work for fungi that don't handle being in the soil by themselves. So we'll talk about a famous fungal uh, uh, pathogen, and this is actually a fungal pathogen that can survive in the soil. So even if you are to till in the infected plant residue from this particular disease, you can still get it because potato blight or late blight is caused by Phytophthora infestans. And Phytophthora infestans is it's actually technically not a fungus, it's a water mold, but it's a fungal-like organism, very similar to fun fungi. Uh, it was considered a fungus up until about, I don't know, 15 years ago, and then they, they reclassified it as a water mold. So Phytophthora infestans, it was the cause of the Irish potato famine back in the 1840s, 1850s. Um, we all know about that. A million people starved, two million emigrated a lot to the U.S. Um, and unfortunately, at that time, this was before... The, the concepts of modern plant pathology were understood, they didn't know what was causing this, right? So they would put their potatoes in the ground, they would rot, they would scoop up their potatoes, they put them in a big heaping pile right next to the field. And they would try to plant again. What they didn't realize is that this was being caused by a microorganism and it was getting washed out of those piles and right back into the field. And they, they just didn't understand sanitation um, and how to try to lower the amount of, of this particular fungus or water mold that was in their soil. And so of course, uh, the Irish potato famine occurred. So nematodes, nematodes are microscopic worm-like animals. They're not worm-like, they are worms. 
Um, I don't know why he says worm like there. They're worms. Um, they feed on the roots mostly, but they can also feed on the above ground parts of plants, um, especially in more tropical uh, conditions. So even here in Florida, you do see a lot more foliar feeding nematodes than where I'm from up in Nebraska. Mostly if it's the, if you're dealing with nematodes, it's on the roots, they're in the soil. Uh, but we'll talk about in, in a little bit here, an actual example of a nematode that's pretty common causing a big widespread disease of pines that does exist in the above ground parts of the plant. So the roots will become distorted or galled after feeding occurs. Bottle brushing is a very common sign of nematode feeding where you've got a proliferation of the tiny little lateral roots. So it almost looks like a bottle brush um, or a pipe cleaner. Um, and they can survive very readily in the soil. So, so tillage of infected plant residue will not work for nematode control. In fact, tillage or anything that you do to move the soil within your field is going to also move nematodes if they're present. So um, very important for understanding how to manage these things. Uh, and then phytoplasmas. Um, so there, even though the organism itself is similar to a bacterium, they're actually spread and their infection uh, mimics that of a virus. So they're more similar to, to viruses in that manner. They will cause stunting, chlorosis, or epinasty, excuse me, which is just abnormal growth. Um, so you see the bottom left picture there, that's palm decline. That's something that y'all may have heard of because that definitely affects us here in the industry uh, down south and uh, in, in, in California. Um, but palm decline is caused by a phytoplasma. Um, it, it, I'll show a picture of kind of how it causes the decline um, coming up. Yeah, next slide. Uh, in the middle there, that's a cassava root. Uh, I took that uh, picture. I did a small internship in Colombia, um, and that was outside of Cali, Colombia. And um, that's frog skin disease of, of, um, of cassava. And so you'll see I'm holding two cassava roots. The top one is what you want. And you can see I've peeled a couple layers of the skin off and it's easy to do. Plus there's just more to the root, right? So um, a big part of cassava production is that they also, they turn it into a cassava flower. And in order to do that, they have to peel it, right? So you want a lot of biomass and you want it to peel easily. Well, this frog skin disease causes this really rugged skin. And so you can see the one that I'm holding below it um, has frog skin. And um, it, it chips off rather than peeling nice and easily. The, the outside bark, it's not bark, but the outside layer, the epidermis just chips off and there's not much to it. So it, it's really nasty for their industry down in South America. And then uh, in the, the right hand picture, you can see that's a witch's broom, um, which is caused by a phytoplasma. And a witch's broom just means that you get a proliferation of, of buds or nodes. So where you would have this much space between nodes, all of a sudden you have this much space between nodes. So you get a lot of lateral branching and you get this weird looking, uh, you know, little growth on a plant. Um, so a lot of what we're gonna talk about today, um, a lot of the diseases that we'll see, you may need to confirm in a laboratory, right? So. Um, a lot of times we're left with just the symptoms. And when I say symptom, and we're going to go through that here in a little bit, a symptom is something that the plant does in response to a pathogen being there. So yellow leaves, things like that. We can try to diagnose that way, but it's hard to be 100% accurate. If we want to be 100% accurate, sometimes we have to submit our plants into a clinic where they can run some of these tests like electron microscopy. So that picture on the left, that's a cross section of the xylem of a palm and that palm has palm decline caused by that phytoplasma. So you can see all of those um, little, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, amorphous little blobs. Some are more rod shaped, some are circular. Those are all phytoplasmas causing that palm decline. And it basically just gets that into the xylem and the phloem and clogs it up. So this is a phloem loading cell or it's not a, it's, it's a loading cell because it has a nucleus. And then the cell on the right here is a xylem cell, no nucleus. Um, so, but it gets in both and just, just clogs up the water conducting elements really bad. Um, so they also have serological tests. Um, serological tests work a lot like pregnancy tests, right? It's picking up an antibody, or if you've ever done the at-home um, COVID test, now all of a sudden that's too real. We all know too much about that. 
Um, the at-home COVID test looks a lot like these immuno strips from AgDia. Um, basically, a single line means that it's negative, but the test is working. Double line means um, that you have a positive result and the test is working. Some of them will have three. This uh, this strip here in the in this picture actually tech, uh, detects two pathogens at once, which is pretty cool. So it'll actually have three lines if both of the of the pathogens are there. So both pathogens and then the, the control line. Oops, uh, and then molecular tests, of course, using DNA to get uh, a positive identification of a particular pathogen, um, that also works. And what I don't show on this slide is just uh, plain old microscopy, which is the first thing typically that diagnosticians use. It's just a good old light microscope uh, to, to get in there and, and look around on the plant and see what's going on. So um, before we kind of can continue, I just wanna clarify a couple of, of terms that I'm gonna use a lot. Probably so. When I say a disease, the disease is any malfunctioning of a host cell and tissue that results from continuous irritation by a pathogenic agent or environmental factor, and leads to the development of symptoms. Okay, so a pathogen is the actual entity, usually a microorganism, that incites the disease. Right. So citrus greening is a disease caused by oh radio back okay i can't think of the bacteria's name off my top of my head because it's really hard to pronounce but we'll see it here in a little bit um, but the bacterium is the pathogen the disease is citrus greening so if we look at the example on this slide pine wilt is the disease but it's caused by the pathogen brucephalanchus xylophilus which is a nematode or a plant parasite that's that's the whole debate is it a pathogen or a plant parasite doesn't matter for now we're going to call it a pathogen so the causal agent is the nematode, but the disease is called pine wilt. And then um, a sign versus a symptom is also very important. Um, so a sign is actual visible evidence of the pathogen, right? So what we're seeing in those top pictures, the top left picture, that is cedar apple rust. That's a goal on the cedar side of, of the rust. Um, so it affects apple and cedar. So, so that cedar, it's a gall, and those orange little protrusions are, are a mass of teleospores. So that's actually the fungus. And then, of course, you can see uh, this chicken of the woods there, I believe, that yellow fungus, um, the shelf ascocarp. Um, that's the fungal reproductive structure, and then the spores fall out of the bottom so that you're seeing the fungus. So it's a lot easier to see fungi. You can't see viruses, so viruses won't really ever have a sign unless you're using an electron microscope to see it. Uh, but but uh, uh, fungi leave signs a lot. So a symptom, in contrast, is the various changes in function and appearance of the infected plant. So it's the plant's response to actually being infected by the pathogen. So chlorosis, you know, yellowing is is a symptom. Um, Here's a tricky one that I put in that bottom right hand corner. So I know you can't respond to me in real time, but does anyone know what that is? If I told you that the host was tomato. So this is the blossom end of the tomato. And this is called blossom end rot. And so this is actually caused by a calcium deficiency. So there's not enough calcium when fruit set is occurring. So you get the blossom end that just doesn't form right. As a result, you will get fungi that come in there and colonize that dead plant material. So you might look at that and say, oh, look, it's fuzzy. There's a fungus here. This must be a sign. Well, it's actually a symptom because it's a calcium deficiency that causes um, uneven development or just um, not, you know, not full development of that blossom end, um, which subsequently gets infected. But there's no plant pathogen at work there. It's just a plant necro or a, a fungal necrotroph, meaning that fungus is only surviving off of the already dead material. It's not infecting the live material. Okay, pop quiz. Again, I know you can't really answer, um, but this is the trunk of an apple tree. And you can see there that it's kind of dripping, it's oozing, right? Oops, oops. Um, it's dripping or oozing. So what would that ooze be? Is that a sign or a symptom? 
And not to keep you waiting too long, I'll give you the answer. It's actually kind of a trick question. So this uh, particular apple tree has fire blight. Fire blight is caused by a bacterium. The bacterium causes the plant to ooze and exude. So that's tree sap, which would be a sign, a symptom, but it's also loaded with thousands and thousands and thousands of bacterial cells. You can't really see those bacterial cells, but they're there. They're a part of that exudate. So it's also kind of a sign, uh, but it is more of a symptom because it's the plant doing it. But even though the bacteria is there, we can kind of call it a sign. So that was a trick question, but a sign is the actual pathogen. The symptom is the plant's response to that pathogen. Okay, I think I beat that to death. Uh, abiotic diseases, just showing you just some examples of that. We don't have to spend too much time on this. This isn't something that we have to deal with down here in the South too much, but this is really common, especially on our soft, soft wooded hardwoods like maple. Um, maple loves to get a jump on things in the spring, right? So as soon as the soil is no longer frozen up in the Midwest, it'll start conducting water up and up and up. But if we get a late freeze, well, what happens to water when it freezes? It expands, right? So we've got this trunk of this kind of soft hardwood um, full of water. It freezes and it cracks it open. So you're seeing a bunch of uh, fungi on there, right? Ascocarps. So those are there just because that tree's already dead. Those fungi had nothing to do with that. They're taking advantage of the dead tree. Um, and it's dead because the, 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 the bark split open and exposed the vascular cambium and it could no longer grow. So frost crack is very typical in maples. Doesn't always kill the tree, but it can if it's young enough. Root girdling is another abiotic disease. So a lot of containerized stock. Unfortunately, if it's been in the container for a really long time, those roots will grow. They'll hit the side of the container and they'll start circling. Um, this can become an issue if you put this in the ground. Of course, we know that the caliper increases of a tree, it increases on a tree as it gets older. So that diameter of the base of the stem is gonna get wider. If it's encircled with roots, it'll girdle itself and it'll kill itself. So we'll see people put trees in the ground four, five, six, seven years go by and all of a sudden it just dies. And for what appears to be no reason, they dig it up, they realize they bought a containerized uh, uh, plant and they'll dig around the roots and sure enough, it'll be, it'll be circled. <clears throat> oh, I wish that, I wish that wasn't up there, what that is. I was gonna quiz you guys on that, but you can see what caused this. So again, this is more of a problem up North Right, so in the winter time, uh, the, the sidewalks get super icy. One way to combat that is we put down salt. Um, you, the, the, the ice melts. We have extremely sodic soils and um, they can cause burn. So that's, uh, those are yew bushes. And you can see all along that building, there, they've, got, they've got salt damage. So um, what's a good way to fix salt damage? Uh, the only thing you can really do is water, 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 and try to flush all that salt out of the soil. Uh, again, not a huge issue down here because uh, our soils don't freeze typically, um, but winter injury is really common on our evergreens. So something that's going to be continuously photosynthesizing throughout the year will experience winter burn if the uh, ground is frozen and they can no longer pull water, right? But they're still photosynthesizing. So you'll often see it at the very tippy tops of the plant or the very tips of the branches because that's the hardest to get water to. So it'll start dying back from the top down. And you'll see winter injury in Christmas tree farms all over in the Midwest. It can even happen on older trees. You can see those two older um, Norway spruce there. Lawnmower blight is a big one. So you'll see girdling uh, basically or um, cankers form on the base of trees because landscape professionals sometimes get a little too close. And then of course we have herbicide drift that we have to deal with. Um, uh, we typically see herbicide drift problems with our, um, our growth regulator type herbicides because they're extremely, um, they're extremely volatile and they get up in the air and drift for very far. So, wow, okay, gosh, time goes flies when you're having fun. Okay, so let's get into some specific diseases that we might see. Um, and I'm going to try to keep this um, more towards the southern diseases. This is a, a tip light of, of pine that we may see down here. It's not as common, but this is called diplodia. 
or it used to be called diplodia and then the mycologist said hey let's change it to something that's more easy to pronounce spheropsis so <laughs> spheropsis dip light now is what it's called uh, causes the very tips the candles of the pine tree to die back it will reproduce on the cones. So if we look at the right-hand picture, you see all those little black dots? If we were to zoom in on that black dot and pick one of those little black dots out, we see that it's actually contained within a pycnidium. So it's this circular cased uh, housing that, that will open up and release all those spores. So you can see that housing there in the bottom right-hand picture, and then you can see all the individual spores. That's what we're looking for in a diagnostic lab to confirm something like this. Um, so, uh, we'll kind of blow through what it what it gets on but it has a, a wide range of of uh, pines that it can um that it can uh, infect so in general when we're talking about managing plant diseases especially if it's a fungal disease we want to make sure we're not crowding our plants um, we want to make sure there's adequate airflow and sunlight penetration into the canopy why because as we mentioned, that film of water is needed for most of our fungi to actively penetrate plant surfaces. So if we're doing what we can to make sure that that canopy of our plants, whether it's a tree, whether it's um, tiny little seedlings in the greenhouse, we want to make sure that, excuse me, that, the, that that foliage is staying dry. And then, of course, there's, there's a ton of protective fungicides that you can use um, and even some curatives. But in general, fungicides are more protectant than they are curative. So you kind of have to get it on there ahead of time and, and, and uh, avoid infection to begin with. Because once the plant's infected, there's less options that you have available. Uh, we're going to skip Dothostroma. It's another fungal needle blight, but we don't really deal with it a whole lot down here. I do want to talk about pine wilt because pine wilt is a very, very interesting plant disease complex. There's a lot going on here. Um, it, it mostly infects scotch pine, although it can also get on Austrian pines, rarely on white, but it does happen. Um, it only affects older trees, which is interesting, 10 years old or older, and it's very rapid decline once they get this disease uh, in a matter of seven days, healthy tree to dead tree. Um, and it's actually caused by a nematode. And as I mentioned earlier, I was going to talk about a nematode that survives in the above ground parts of the plant. That's, that's this case here. But that nematode needs a way to get from tree to tree. And that's facilitated by a big longhorn beetle called the pine sawyer beetle. So we have a tree, it's healthy, right? All of a sudden the pine sawyer beetle comes along and it feeds on this. Um, and what it does is it ends up, um, as it's feeding, it transmits, uh, and it also lays its eggs rather uh, in, in the pine as well. So it feeds on it and it lays its eggs in the pine. And as it does that, it transmits Prosophilanchus xylophilus, this nematode, right? So they enter through the feeding wounds. And if it's a resistant host, nothing. The nematodes die, no worries. If it's like a ponderosa pine, you're fine. But if it's a scotch pine, that thing is dead within about seven days. So you will also see bark beetle galleries on this tree. As the tree dies, it releases pheromones that attract another beetle, the bark beetle. Okay, so different than the pine sawyer beetle. The bark beetle comes, the bark beetle also has attached to it a fungus called the blue stain fungus, right? So the nematodes will actually feed on this blue stain fungus and they will just reproduce gangbusters. And so much so that it basically clogs the water conducting elements of the tree. And that's in the end what kills it, right? So, so we've got the pine sawyer beetle, it comes along, it feeds, it lays its eggs, it releases this nematode. The nematode feeds on the blue stain fungus, which was actually brought to the tree by a different beetle, the bark beetle, right? So the nematode grows, I'm sorry, sorry, the larvae of the pine sawyer beetle grows. And as it's growing, it gets infected with all these nematodes, right? All these nematodes, they, they hide in its mouth parts, under its wings once it turns into an adult. And when they emerge as adults, they, have, they leave these huge emergent holes because they're a big beetle. Um, and when they emerge as adults, they're infected with the nematode. It's in their stomach. It's on their mouth parts. And then when they go feed on another plant, they release that nematode. So it's this huge complex of all these different organisms that, that results in this, this pine wilt um, disease that happens very quickly. And then, of course, the blue stain fungus, um, it, you can get 
in, in the wood industry, you can get knocked. They don't like to make um, uh, two by fours out of this. Um, but they have found out that when you stain it, it's very pretty. So some of the more artsy woodworking type of people love the blue stain fungus and love pine that's infected with this because it turns out really pretty. So that's kind of a really interesting, very cool um, disease complex. What can you do to prevent it? Spraying for the insect doesn't really help. Um, so a lot of times what you got to do is you just have to, once you know that that tree is infected, as soon as it declines and dies, you got to cut the tree down, remove it, burn, chip, or bury that plant. But if you chip it, you have to chip them less than an inch and a half because you're trying to kill that big pine sawyer beetle larvae that's in there. And you're trying to prevent it from escaping and, and re-releasing and, and, and causing more infection. So you have to remove the tree as soon as you see it die. Um, anthracnose is a big uh, fungal disease that we have down here on a lot of different uh, tree species, especially sycamore. Um, it is a fungal disease that attacks the leaves and it usually attacks the veins of the leaves. So you can see on that leaf there, a lot of the um, uh, uh, lesions are, are centered on the vein and then they kind of expand up around the vein. That's very indicative of, of um, anthracnose. It gets on oak, it's on ash all sorts of, of plants. And you can see in the bottom picture here, this is very typical of anthracnose. Anthracnose creates spores, but the spores are contained on these black finger-like projections called acervulae. And so you can see the black finger-like projections, and then you can see all the individual spores that are released. So anytime you have anthracnose, you'll see those black finger-like projections. And that's a compound microscope image there but a light, a stereoscope, which doesn't get you as zoomed in, you can still see those black fingers from the plant surface emerging. So they'll come and they'll stick out of the plant surface and release those spores. It's pretty nasty looking. Okay, so my goodness, it's already past quarter till. I was supposed to leave at least 15 minutes or more for questions. And so I don't wanna go over. I have so many more diseases to talk about. It's so hard to fit everything into just an hour talk. So uh, I, if there's anything you were really itching to hear about, I can try to, to touch on it. Um, specifically, I know there's some, some bigger, uh, more popular diseases that are down here. Let me real quick just go, cedar apple rust is big, but we don't have a lot of apples in Florida. Fire blight, we talked about a little bit, um, but I do just want to quickly cover citrus greening because it's also kind of an interesting disease complex. You'll see thinning in the canopy. You'll see abnormal chlorosis. Like one side of the tree will be dark green. The other side will be really chlorotic. What it causes is misshapen leaves. So on either side of the midrib, you'll have one that's formed normally and the other one that's there's just something not formed right about it. Um, and you'll have this spotty chlorosis where it's not like a nutrient deficiency where Sometimes it'll be the whole leaf yellow or the veins will be dark uh, green, yet the rest of the leaf will be yellow or just the veins will be yellow. No, it's really blotchy. Um, it gets on a wide range of citrus and then it causes the fruit also to develop abnormal, right? So this is a bacterial disease called Candidatus uh, Libobacter asiaticus. Um, and the bacterium is, again, it has to take advantage of wounds or some other method to get into that plant. So in and of itself, it can't really affect. It relies on the Asian citrus psyllid um, to, to feed on infected plants, pick up that bacterium, and then carry it to another uninfected plant, and then kind of start that disease cycle over. So it's a bacterial disease, but it's exacerbated by the fact that it, it gets carried around by this Asian citrus psyllid. And the psyllid has a proboscis, so it has also like a needle-like uh, mouth projection, like a straw, it could stick in the plant and suck up those plant juices. Um, and that's how the bacterium is released and taken up. So I don't wanna go over time and I wanna allow for questions. And if you guys wanna have me back so I can finish this talk, I'd be more than happy to. So much disease, so little time. Um, one thing I will say before I open up for questions is that when I get done with these talks, sometimes people say, wow, it's a, it's a wonder we can grow anything at all with all these things attacking our plants. But disease is actually the exception to the rule. Um, all the things that have to come together for disease to happen, it's really quite amazing that it does happen. So go out there, grow your plants. Um, you will mostly escape this. But if you do have an, an issue, contact your local extension agent and we'll get a proper diagnosis so you can start the proper management.
Very good, Kevin. Thank you so much. Um, you, you covered a lot in in a short period of time. So it uh, it's a, a great refresher. Um, you know, I picked up a lot of good things. So thank you so much for sharing that information. Um, there have been some questions that have uh, come through, and so I'm I'm gonna uh, kind of read those back to you. Uh, can cold damage look like bacterial damage? Um, kind of, yeah, especially um, uh, uh, fire blight, right? Because cold damage typically starts at the top of the plants where the cold is settling, and you'll see the plants either brown or blacken. And um, that's the, that's the uh, classic indication of um, fire blight is, is a shepherd's crooking of the very tip of a branch, and then it turns like black, fire blight. So it, it, they can, and plus when, when the, the leaves freeze, those cells burst open. So you get that water soaking appearance, which is also very common for bacterial infections. So yeah, frost damage does mimic bacterial infection. You just kind of have to look at your weather and see, oh, it, it frosted last night. This is probably frost rather than bacteria, but yes, it can. Unfortunately, we've seen way too much of that frost damage as very of late. recently, <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, at what point is the disease problem too serious that the plant is not savable? So um, that, uh, that all depends on, on what you're growing, right? So if it's some kind of an edible plant, um, if it's no longer going to produce that fruit, obviously, you know, you got to pitch it. Sometimes that's hard to tell. If it's an ornamental and the, um, the diseased area is confined to a part of, let's say it's a shrub, and you can prune that diseased area out and still maintain the aesthetics of that plant, you could keep it. So I don't want to say it depends because that's kind of a cheap answer, but it really does depend on what you have, what disease you have, and what plant you're growing. So there are, there are also some uh, fungal pathogens or, or pathogens in general that don't move very readily within the plant. If they infect the leaf, that's pretty much where they're going to be is on that leaf. But then there's others that can move in the plants, uh, water conducting elements and things like that. So a lot of times viral infections, as soon as you have a viral infection, even if it's on one part of a plant, you should probably remove the whole plant to ensure that the rest of your plants don't get it. Plus with viruses, you might see a symptom in the leaf over here and the virus is actually in the leaf over here. So it's very hard to tell where the virus is at within that plant. So a lot of times with viruses, just rogue it out. Very good. Um... What insects are vectors for nematodes? I know you gave us one. Are there mm -hmm. others that you know of? Yeah, um, beetles are, are a big one. Um, you don't hear a lot with aph aphids. I'd say no spider mites, no thrips, no white flies. No, I don't think I've ever, and I'm saying no, but there's always an exception to the rule, but nothing common that I know of, mostly beetles. Um, Yeah, mostly beetles, and, and, and they typically only need them to infect the above ground parts of the plant because nematodes, they can't swim, but they can thrash, so they can move in the soil. So they don't need a vector to move around in the soil as much, so they can facilitate reaching a plant root on their own. But when it's above ground, uh, yeah, beetles are the only ones that I really know of that vector nematodes. Okay, great. Can uh, sugarcane get phytoplasmas? Possibly. That's a, that's a, I, would, I would need to research whether there's a, a phytoplasma disease of sugarcane. Um, I, I, I don't know of a specific one, but it's very likely that they could, yes. Um, and and it's, sometimes it's as simple as Googling phytoplasma disease of sugarcane and just make sure it's coming from a, a reliable source like a .edu or something like that. Um, and, and, and there could be, I just don't know of one off the top of my head. Okay, great. Thanks, Kevin. Mm -hmm. um, are the serological tests uh, that you showed available to the trade? Um, yeah, they are, they should be, um, especially those uh, dip tests, those immunostrip tests mm -hmm. um, through Agdea, another company that produces them is Neogen. But yeah, they're, um, Oh, I used to have them priced out when I was in the clinic, but it's been five years now since I've been in the clinic and I, I haven't bought any. But the problem is, is that they don't have them for a, lot, a wide range of diseases, mostly just really, really common diseases. 
um, like tomato wilt, um, things like that. So the, the, they're available to tradesmen and women, but they are, they're only, there's only some specific diseases that they have them developed for. So yeah, look through Agdia and Neogen are the two, there's probably more companies now producing them, but um, yeah, they're available. And I highly recommend them because they work really well if you have that specific disease. Yeah, probably more for agronomic crops than, than horticulture crops, would you think? Um, just because the, the vast um, space, the area planted? Yeah, I would, um, not necessarily. Um, I would say they're probably more readily available for food crops versus ornamental crops. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I know like one of the first ones that was developed was for, for tomato wilt, which you know, you can grow tomatoes in big fields, but you can also grow at small scale in, in, um, in, in greenhouses. Um, so it's just a matter of kind of looking for the disease that you have and seeing if there's one available. Super. Um, can spheropsis affect South Florida slash pines? I have not seen tip blight down here. Now that's not to say it doesn't exist. Um, it's not something I've seen. Um, yeah. I, I don't want to say no, because it probably could, but I don't think we have a whole lot of that fungal pathogen down here. I haven't seen a lot of it. Um, and I would need to look on the host list for spiropsis, spiropsis uh, to see if slash pine is on there. Uh, there's actually, unfortunately, there's a whole list of other things that affect the tips of, of, of our needles, of, of our pine needles down here, like pine tip moth um, and, and some other things. So it's probably that versus the, the diplodia or the spheropsis. But if you think you might have it, um, definitely get a hold of your, your agent and, uh, and consider submitting one to the clinic. What, what you should look for if you have slash pine is the pine cones, right? So if you're, if you're seeing tip needle dieback, you think, ooh, this could be diplodia or spheropsis, same thing. Find a pine cone, especially a, a kind of an older one that's fallen to the ground and look for those little black dots on the bottom of the pine cone. Those are a good indication that you may have it. Super. Um, doesn't UF recommend grouping trees together so they'll support each other uh, in storms? Yeah, I think they were thinking about, you know, just uh, my guess is they were probably thinking, you know, when you're clearing a piece of property, you know, should you save groups of trees versus individuals? Yeah. And I think they may have been referring to the fact that I said you want to open up the canopy and, and tree spacing right. is important. Yeah. So it's, it's always a trade-off. Um, it's always a trade-off. We get plenty of sun. Well, we get plenty of sun down here, but we also have really high relative humidity. So every morning when you wake up, there's dew on things. So it's really hard to keep your canopy dry in Florida. Um, but luckily, you know, well, well, what you can do is group trees together, but make sure they're different species. Because if you have one species of tree um, in a group, then it's more likely that a single fungus can come in there and, and wreak havoc. So that's one thing too that I may not have mentioned that is that most of our pathogens are specific to a certain species. So diversity is always key. If you have a diverse group of trees and they're supporting each other that way, that's, you know, maybe that's a better trade-off. Um, and yeah, you're, you're, you're sacrificing canopy openness, but again, here in Florida, because of our dew, it's, it's kind of hard to, 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 completely keep them from getting wet but again they do dry out because the wind and sun so so yeah it, it just depends on if you have a history of, of, of that particular leaf blight in your trees you may want to open them up spread them apart but if not you could probably keep them together super um this this is one that uh i you know i don't know that it's even fair to give to you because <laughs> coming from nebraska it's uh what is the most common disease seen in South Florida shrubs and turf? You know, I don't know if you've interacted with uh, enough folks in South Florida to, to know what's most prevalent down there. Uh, you know, unfortunately not really. Um, well, when you mentioned turf, a big thing that comes to mind is um, ne nematodes in general in Florida are, are huge because of our sandy soils. So nematodes are a very big problem and we have many different species of nematode that we have to worry about and it's actually the same for trees and shrubs so even though that's not a specific disease that's a, it's more of a pathogen type um, nematodes are, are one of the bigger issues 
Um, in fact, it's one of the issues keeping us from really good hop production. We're trying to grow hops down here and, and we're just getting obliterated by nematodes. Um, but to answer that question, you would really have to, well, you did, you, you narrowed down the host by saying shrubs or turf. Um, another thing I would mention too, I guess, is powdery mildew is a very common one. Um, I, there's always an exception to the rule. So whereas most fungi need that layer of water to actively infect, powdery mildew doesn't. All it needs is really high humidity. We have plenty of that here in the state. So high humidity uh, exacerbates powdery mildew. And I would say that's one of the more common diseases that we have. All right. What about, um, are there ways to prevent citrus greening? So I think that's the big question for the researchers now. Um, yeah. You know, going after the insects kind of helps, but it's a timing issue. Our insecticides, if that's what we're going to use, uh, they only last for so long and their residual may run out and then the insect comes. So we haven't gotten a great handle on it by trying to control the insect. Um, and there isn't any type of curative action that we have for the bacterium. So preventatively, uh, the thing you have to do is just present that, that uh, prevent that psyllid from feeding. And, um, you know, I think if you came up with something, you'd be a bajillionaire because it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue right now. And we haven't really come up with a good trick to, to prevent it, um, you know, other than the harsh ways, which is if you have an infected tree, you get rid of it so it doesn't spread to your other trees. Um, unfortunately, that's kind of, that's, that's the cure all for when, uh, when we have something that doesn't have a real good preventative measure is getting rid of the infected material to try to reduce that bacterium load. Yeah, is there, uh, is there a wasp um, that uh, can kill that psyllid that you're aware of? So I, I think there has been some work with uh, biological control agents for the psyllid. Um, it's typically a wasp that will parasitize. Um, again, the, the infection rates aren't great for that. Um, the parasitization rates, I should say. Uh, typically, you have to plant other uh, plants that encourage the... Um, encourage um, kind of, uh, what am I trying to, say? not housing because they don't, but, but um, host plants for those, for those particular wasp species so that they're in higher numbers around our citrus fields. So uh, I do believe there are, there are some efforts for biological control agents, but again, they haven't been super duper effective, unfortunately for that psyllid. It, it's got a really uh, far flight, uh, uh, flight time too. So insects can stay in the air for only, you know, only so long. This, this one can actually fly for a, a pretty good distance. So it, it's just hard to get a control on them, even with a, a biological. All right, does UF have studies on the use of biochar against fungus such as Phytophthora? Um, I, there, there may be, I'm, I'm not super familiar with uh, the literature on, on that coming from UF. Um, that, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I, I don't know that I can answer that. Um, and, and if it would have antifungal properties and where they're at with that, I do apologize. I, I, don't, I don't really know. I would have to study up on that before giving an educated answer on that. Yeah, and I'm not aware of any of those studies. They, they might be there, but um, yeah. it's not something I, I'm familiar with. Yeah, not with specifically with biochar. Sorry about that. Any experience using steam to sterilize soil? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, that's how we did it in our soil, our, in our lab, in our greenhouse, rather, sorry, up in Nebraska, uh, we would have the big steam, uh, steam tanks that you hook up the steam line to and uh, steam sterilize. You, I think, uh, what is it, 160 degrees Fahrenheit is, is uh, will kill most of your bad guys. Um, and uh, it'll actually retain some of the good soil microbes. But yeah, that works. You can do it in a field setting too. It's not necessarily steam, it's more solarization, but you can cover uh, an area out in the landscape with, uh, with a plastic. Um, and, and the idea there is you kind of create the greenhouse effect with the plastic and it heats up the soil to a temperature that will cause uh, some of the, the, the bad guys to die as well. But it only, it only gets you about four, inches deep, maybe six inches deep in the soil. So it doesn't work great out in the field, but it works really great for soilless media in the greenhouse. 
Okay. Um, do the same nematodes and pathogens potentially impact turf grass, uh, I assume, as well as other plant material? Yeah. Um, so there's like sting nematode, uh, root knot nematode, root, root gall, um, lance nematode. There's this huge, huge uh, network of nematodes that infect grasses. So turf grasses, ornamental grasses, corn, sorghum, wheat, those are all grasses. So there's a lot of overlap between agronomic and, and the turf industry in, in terms of uh, uh, species. But then there are different species that affect our woodies um, and, and some of our other shrubby type plants. Those would be a little bit different than our turf pesticides, uh, pesticides, turf nematode pests. Um, so yes, if it's a kind of a grass, and, and no, if it's like a tree versus a turf grass, there would be different species makeup there. Um, so yeah, again, there, there is some host specificity with our pathogens. Um, Have you ever used beneficial nematodes to help with the bad ones? Uh, yeah, there, there is some work with that, um, but a lot of times those beneficials already exist, right? So. Um, there's plant pathogenic nematodes, there's nematodes that feed strictly on fungi, and then there's predators, and they have, a, you know, I showed you that like arrowy stylet that the plant pathogens have or plant parasites have. Well, there's nematodes out there with a completely different mouth part, and they actually look like the nematodes, uh, they look like, if you've ever seen the movie Tremors, they kind of look like that, um, and they will eat other nematodes, and I don't know that we do a lot of uh, biological release of those predators because they exist in high, high quantities in the soil naturally. So there's a lot of natural competition going on with those predator nematodes eating the plant parasitic nematodes, yes. Yeah, years ago, there were some, um, some big name brand products um, that were, you could uh, buy off the, the store shelves and you know apply to control mole crickets and some of the other um, mm -hmm. problems out there, but they had, they had some problems keeping them alive and, um, making sure they were fresh enough. And so they're yeah. pretty much gone from the market as far as I've seen. Yeah, they are. And I guess the story I heard of that is, was, um, they actually worked too well that they, you would, you would inoculate your soil with these nematodes and they would kill your mole crickets dead. Um, and then you wouldn't need to buy them anymore. And so it was really hard for a company to keep producing these biological nematodes because they would sell them once and they wouldn't need to sell them back again to that same producer because they work so well. But yeah, unfortunately that's no longer on the market. It was a great biological control for mole crickets. All right, the, uh, the last question I have for you, uh, is there a place where we can take a sample uh, for disease identification in South Florida? Yes, um, yes, they do have, let me, let me get the, uh, Yeah, there's one in the Panhandle, there's one here in Gainesville, and then I do believe there's one down at the, uh, at the Everglades Research and Extension Center. Yeah, the, yes, the, T, the Tropical Research Extension Center, um, which is... Is that Homestead? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, tropical, yeah, wherever the heck that's at, the Tropical Research and Extension Center, I believe is down there in Homestead. But they should probably start with their local extension office. And they, they uh, could, you know, and, and they could, um, and may, you know, maybe kind of uh, triage it there first. And then if they think, oh yeah, this needs to go to the T-Rex, then they'll, they'll send it on to the clinic. But yeah, there is, there is one down south at, at the Tropical Research and Education Center. Kevin, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I, I know you didn't get a chance to see everything that was in the chat. A lot of people found your presentation to be super informative. Um, you okay. took it to a level that made, you know, a, a very complex problems and issues um, a little more understandable. So thank you very much for doing that. And um, a lot of people are uh, wanting you back. So uh, <laughs> you, you may get uh, another invite from us. So um, from uh, from Claire and me, thank you so much for being here, taking the time, and I hope the audience appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you so much. I appreciate your attention, your attention.